You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Okay, my first name, I'm not going to use my real name because I feel that would make me a little bit uncomfortable, so I'm just going to use a little bit of an alias. My name is Stormy. Uh, Just a quick pro tip, Um, usually if uh, people that I know use an alias, they don't say that they're using an alias. Adopt it as your own name, your real name. Uh, Otherwise, people will try to find your real name, knowing that that's not it. Anyway, we'll continue. And I live in Arkansas, and basically just what I wanted to say is that... um, um, So basically, I, I saw your video about Catholicism the other day, and... The thing is, with that, um, I felt like you got some of the things wrong, but it's understandable because, and I'm not saying that Catholicism isn't a cult, it definitely is, I was just in it. Um, There's a lot more information control than you actually might think, it's just that you can't really tell unless you have been in the religion, so that's about it. I appreciate that, and that's actually a good point. Sometimes you don't know unless you're on the inside. And that is why I talk to people about these groups, or I try to, before I actually talk about them on my channel. If I can't talk to people directly about it, then I, like, if I can't find somebody who's a member or something like that, like Heaven's Gate, for example, then I will try to find testimonials from people who have been on the inside and have talked about what it was like. Um, For the Catholicism video specifically, I did talk to somebody who was on the inside, who grew up on the inside, but having grown up on the inside and then left, some of the information they gave might have been outdated. The information that I have about Jehovah's Witnesses is outdated. I left in like 2008 or 2009 or something like that, and it's changed a lot since then. Now, I try to keep up with information about the Jehovah's Witnesses, but it still gets outdated. I still lose touch on a lot of the cultural things. Their culture changes year to year. And it's the same with Catholicism. Another problem you'll run into with Catholicism is a fact that it differs even just a little bit from church to church. So the information that I get from one person may not be the same as the information I get from another person. I try to find common information. So if I went a little bit light on some of the stuff like information control, the reason that I went so light on it is because I wanted to be super extra generous with my assessments. If I'm generous with the assessments and it still turns out to be a cult, then I feel comfortable calling it a cult one way or another. If I'm too specific and it doesn't really apply across the board, then I don't feel right about calling it a cult necessarily. As it stands, I was willing to reach out and call it a cult, even being as generous as I was. Hey, Owen, this is James. I had called your uh, show a while back once about uh, where politics and religion meshed, and the other, I was sharing you what caused me to become an atheist. And as an atheist and someone who had been bullied during my life, uh, you don't deserve that. You deserve much better. And uh, if anything... I am on your side, uh, whether you, whether you share this on YouTube or not, I, I am on your side. Uh, I hope this boils down and I hope you do find some happiness. You have a good week. I appreciate that. Um, for the record, I, I have found happiness. I am happy. I'm very happy and satisfied with what I did, I feel like it was the right thing. I feel like calling out a a health teacher for breaking the law, for violating people's constitutional amendments, for talking shit about atheists and atheist parents, for talking shit about LGBT kids, uh, I feel like it was right for me to report her, and despite the backlash, I would have done it again. 
I would have done it again, no matter what. Now, that being said, I, I know you're not the only Christian either. I would say this is a very specific subset of Christian extremist that's coming after me. I call it Christian ISIS. It is the most extreme of the most extreme evangelical nutcases that are coming after me. In my area in West Virginia, Pentecostalism is really, really popular, and Dominionism. And along with Pentecostalism and Dominionism usually comes the evangelical ideology, if you will. So I know that it's not every Christian. I I would say it's not even most Christians. I would say a lot of Christians uh, agree with me. It's just this subset of extremists that fucking hate me. And you know what? This is a dangerous job I picked. I knew that one of these days an extremist group that I cover would most likely come after me violently, which is exactly what's happening right now. Um, I, I knew that this was going to take place. I just wish that my girlfriend and my daughter weren't wrapped up in it too. Um, lucky for me, a lot of the vitriol and threats are targeted at me, and my daughter is no longer in state until I move permanently, so she's safe too. So um, I can take it. I can handle it. We'll, we'll make it through. We'll come out the other side stronger, and I appreciate your support. Chrissy, Seattle, Washington. I had a question. I have family that lives not too far away from me, maybe about two hours away. And they are evangelical and they're independent fundamental Baptists. And apparently every year, I just found out about this, they celebrate Jesus' birthday in like this solemn ceremony. And it's around this time of the year. Um, I was curious if, you know, when you were a Jehovah's Witness, if they did anything like that. Interesting question. Um, Well, Jehovah's Witnesses do do something similar. They call it the memorial, but they don't, it's not a celebration of Jesus' birthday. It's basically a celebration of his death, quote unquote. And they really do call it a holiday. Like Jehovah's Witnesses call it a holiday that we are ordered to celebrate. But they don't like get balloons and candles and party down and get drunk and all that stuff. Doesn't really work that way on this holiday. It's more of like an observance than anything else. It's basically where, you know, at Passover, when Jesus was sitting at the table with all of his people, he passed out the bread and he passed out the wine and he said, this is my body, this is my blood and do this every year in remembrance of me, blah, blah, blah. That's what they're doing. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses do. You guys have probably gotten invitations in the mail. Every single year, Jehovah's Witnesses do this big push to try to get invitations to the memorial out to everybody that they possibly can. Now, since COVID, they've been observing the memorial in the privacy of their own homes. But every year, usually... They do it at the Kingdom Hall. They'll have like an hour-long talk, and then they pass the bread and the wine around to everybody. Every single person has to touch the plate, but only anointed people are supposed to actually eat the bread and drink the wine. It's basically like communion, pretty much. The way that Jehovah's Witnesses view communion is very different from everybody else, every other denomination. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that only anointed people, of which there are only 144,000 total in the world ever since the dawn of time, only those people are supposed to partake of it. And in their view, only those people are viewed as Christians exactly, really. Uh, It's kind of weird the way that their theology meshes with other Christian ideologies, if you will. Every other person who is not anointed, but is also a baptized Jehovah's Witness, every other one of those people are considered part of the great crowd that's discussed in the book of Revelation. That being said, I find it fascinating that your family, I think you said, celebrates his birthday around March, because I 
I could be wrong here. I think the Bible said Jesus was 33 and a half when he died, right? And he died on Easter, or Good Friday, technically, is when he died, right? That's why he raised he was raised from the dead again on Sunday or whatever the holy fuck happened. So if he was 33 and a half in March, that would make him that would make that would put his birthday in like October sometime. I mean, I I think the dude was fictional anyways. I have no reason to believe that he was actually real. Somebody gave me some evidence he was. I would accept it, but I haven't seen that evidence yet. I just think it's really fucking bizarre that people are telling us that, you know, they're trying to fabricate his birthday. They're trying to extrapolate his birthday when there's no reason to think the dude was real in the first place. Scapo, the 144,000 is interesting because evangelicals assign that number to how many people will be saved in the seven years of tribulation in the end times. I didn't know that. I did not know that about evangelicals. Yeah. A lot of different groups have their opinions about 144,000, about that number. And I believe it's because in Revelation chapter 7, I think is where it talks about it, it lists the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, And it says 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe, blah, 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 all the way down. And at the end, it lists 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. And according to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is their explanation, may be complete bullshit, may be completely fucking fabricated for all I know. But according to them, the fact that the Bible lists the tribe of Judah at the bottom, uh, that implies that the people don't actually have to be from those literal tribes, don't have to be Jewish people that were part of that lineage, that, that ancestry, because the tribe of Judah wasn't actually a territory and it wasn't actually a lineage. Um, so they say that Gentiles can be part of that calculation too, not just Jewish people from that ancestry. Like I said, could be completely fabricated. Who fucking knows? I don't really trust anything Jehovah's Witnesses have to say. But the there's a group called the 12 Tribes. I think that they believe that children will start breathing fire from their mouths if they beat them enough. And once they beat enough children, that they, that they have 144,000 children breathing fire from their mouths, that is when the Great Tribulation will take place and Armageddon will happen. The 12 Tribes cult. It's a, an extremely destructive, dangerous, vicious cult. And um, it's just not good. Anyways, yeah, a lot of people have weird beliefs about that number. You know what I want to do? I want to make a video about how to move to New York City because it's such a fucking complicated process. I didn't know how all of it worked until I actually tried to do this. And I didn't know that you can actually get really inexpensive apartments there, too. Like, just as inexpensive as where I live right now. You got to be careful where you move because certain areas are owned by other groups of people, you know. Certain, like, Sheep's Head Bay is owned primarily by Russians, and you're kind of pushing up on their turf if you try to move in there without talking to the right people or knowing the right people. So you got to be careful is the point. But moving to New York City is a very, very complicated thing, so... Maybe I'll do a video on it one day. I think that'd be pretty cool. Just kind of a short segment on the fireside chat, maybe, about like finding a broker, what kind of brokers to find, and the pitfalls, and what you're going to end up paying, and the requirements. For example, I've been having trouble moving to New York City because uh, basically I have enough money to prove that I can afford to live in most areas, right? Or in certain specific, this, the areas I want to live in, I can uh, afford to live in those areas well within my means for that. But I haven't checked my credit in 10 fucking years. I haven't even gotten a loan in 10 years or some shit, maybe five years. I, I, I don't have a credit card. I don't have anything so not only is my credit what they call thin like I don't have any real credit history but it's actually outright bad because apparently when I lived in Tampa Florida like in 2013 when I left Tampa Florida the electric company hit me with an $82 bill and put it on my credit and it's been sitting on there for seven years 
I didn't even know it was there. I never checked my credit. And it just kept eating away at my number, just getting it lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. So needless to say, I, you know, not ever, ever checking my credit, never getting a loan and having this bill eating away at my credit over the many, many years, my credit is through the fucking floor and it's nearly impossible to move into New York City as a result because that's one of the main things they look at is your credit. I don't really have any other bad things on my credit. Not many. I think I have like a jeweler's bill from six years ago that's long gone. Uh, and I think I had a sudden link bill for like a missing cable modem or something. Like from six months ago. I moved into another apartment six months ago or eight months ago or something. And I left the cable modem behind and they charged me $200 for it and hit my credit with it. So anyway, needless to say, my credit's really fucking bad because I just never checked it over the seven years, you know? Uh, and if my credit is bad, that means I need a guarantor. So I can move into an apartment in New York City if I can prove that I make 40 times the base monthly rent per year. So if I'm getting a place for $1,000 a month, it has to be 40 times that amount. That means I need to make $40,000 a year to be able to move into a place for 1000 a month, right? That's not a problem. I can prove that I make enough to move into the apartment that I want to move into. But if I have bad credit, as I do, or thin credit, I have to have what's called a guarantor. And a guarantor is basically somebody who co-signs with me, says, yes, I will, you know, I trust this guy to make the payments and I will back up his payments, you know, in case something falls through, you can have my line of credit to make sure that he pays. And the guarantor has to be able to pay 80 times. They have to make 80 times the base rent. So if I want to get a place for $1,000 a month, I have to get a guarantor that makes 80000 a year, not just the 40000 a year that I have to prove. And finding a guarantor that makes twice what I need to be able to move into a place in New York City, pretty fucking complicated. It's been really, really hard to find a guarantor that makes enough to be able to prove that I can, you know, that, that I could move in there and they'd be comfortable with it. It's not $1,000 a month that I'm trying to get either. It's more than that, so... It's just complicated. And not only that, but I have to pay the broker's fee, which is one month's rent, and then I have to pay another month, the first month's rent and, and damage deposit. It was just really complicated. Um, but I do want to go through the whole process one day on, uh, like on stream, like from beginning to end. Once I move to New York City and I get through the whole process, I'll probably go through it. Loretta, I thought you had a guarantor. Do you need help finding one? Oh, it's complicated. Um, basically, <clears throat> you need... All right, so in my case, for me, I need a personal guarantor, not a service, but a personal guarantor that makes $200,000 a year. Uh, I don't make anywhere near that. I'm not trying to rent a place that requires that, but based on the rules that New York City has... That's how much a personal guarantor for me would need to make. Finding somebody that makes that much is not easy. <laughs> so if you know somebody that makes that much, then feel free to put us in contact. But who the fuck makes that much money? Holy shit, dude. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to go to Queens and find a place that has less strict regulations on and, and will overlook my thin credit, pretty much. That's where I'm at. Next, we're going to talk about Michelle Bachman's obsession with the word coup. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com.
The first article I wanted to look at is titled, Michelle Bachman declares God has already sealed the results of this election in heaven. This was written by Kyle Mantilla on Right Wing Watch, and it was written on November 4th, 2020. So this is either right before or maybe the day after the election took place in 2020. I don't remember exactly which day the election was, but either way, it was entirely too early for Michelle Bachman to be calling the results of an election one way or another. Uh, I wanted to look at this specifically because Bachman said some really weird shit recently. Now, I want to get to the weird shit, but to get to the weird shit, we have to do a little bit of lead up. So this article comes with a video. Let's watch the video that came with it and see what she had to say for herself. Remember, this video released, I think, November 3rd, actually. That, that's when the video came out. So let's give it a watch and see what she had to say. I want to know what's going to happen tonight. Okay, so this was election night, I guess. And this guy on this TV program was asking her what's going to happen. Uh, how's the election going to play out? So here's her answer. I think we're going to hear church bells ringing all over the Woo, United yeah. States. People are going to be clicking up their heels. It is going to be victory. I believe that the Lord our God has sealed this election in the heavenlies, and we are going to be rejoicing very soon. There is something very odd about the expression, right? It, it, I, I don't know exactly what it is. It's almost like there's like a vacancy there. I don't know. Anyways, there's absolutely no way she could have possibly known what was going to happen. But that's not where the story ends. She was on this exact same program. A few minutes later, she had more to say about it. This is the second part to the clip. Let's listen. Well, you know, it was said just before that we had a crucial moment four years ago when the intercessors in the prayer room down at KCM Ministries took to heart the different notes that we passed in to pray. And I think that we're at that moment. All right, let me elaborate on what she's saying here. She's basically saying four years ago when Trump was elected, uh, I guess people were giving notes of paper with specific prayers that they wanted answered. They were giving them to these intercessors. Now, I, I don't know if you guys know what intercessors are, but intercessors are people who basically pray on behalf of somebody else. And usually it's kind of a petitionary prayer, like they're praying on behalf of somebody asking for something. They're asking for a favor, asking for help in some way. So I guess that the congressman or others were passing papers to the intercessor prayers, like the intercessors, the people who were supposed to doing the intercessory prayers, they were passing them papers that said what they wanted them to pray for. And I, I guess she's saying that the intercessors were praying for Trump to win, by and large. And as a result of these people praying for Trump to win on behalf of these other people, he won in 2016. That's what she's saying. Now let's continue and see what else she had to say here. The different notes that we passed in to pray. And I think that we're at that moment now where the beauty of this show is that it's interactive. And all of our viewers who are watching, we need them. The body of Christ needs them. And we all need to join in with the intercessors that are praying even now. Okay, hold the fucking phone for a second here. Does God have a divine plan? If God has a divine plan then it's already going to play out that way, right? Why would you praying for something change the results of God's divine plan? I, I forget exactly what George Carlin said. He had this joke about it. He basically said, what is the point of a divine plan if every schmuck with a $2 prayer book can come along and fuck up your plan? That's kind of the whole point of this whole fucking thing, isn't it? Why would God change everything about his plan to fit what these people want? And why would it matter how many people were praying for it? Why would it help if all of the viewers were praying for it rather than just Michelle Bachman? Why does that matter at all? 
Either it's the right thing to do or it's not the right thing to do. And presumably, God is going to do the right thing every time, right? I mean, he's a perfectly good and benevolent and moral being, so he's going to make sure the right thing happens, isn't he? I just don't fucking get the logic, like, at all. It does not add up at all for me. Let's continue. It says, from eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I have done. Okay, so exactly what I was saying before. God has the power to make anything that he wants happen. Why are these people praying like mad? Why are they trying to get viewers to pray like mad? Won't he just do the right thing? And if he, if he really needs people begging at his feet to do the right thing, is he really truly a moral being? No, he's a fucking monster. Let's keep listening. What I would say is that God has already sealed the results of this election. He has sealed it in heaven. Hey, okay. All right. So we're, you know, 2020, 2020 election. That's where we're at right now. And she's saying exactly what I was saying. God would do the moral thing, which in her view is get Trump elected. Not just her view either. In the view of Johnny Enlow, for example, Johnny Enlow said God told him in a vision, he usually leaves it up to us to decide who to vote for, but he is stepping in and taking that responsibility away from us. He wants Donald Trump to be the president. That is what Johnny Enlow said. God showed to him. And it sounds to me like Bachman said, is basically saying the exact same thing here, right? God has decided that Trump is going to be the winner. Let's keep listening. And just as Brother James just told us, Satan wants to intervene with God's plans, and he has a certain amount of authority on this earth. But we as believers have greater authority because the scripture says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So that's... Huh, okay. So Satan has a certain level of authority on earth, but true believers have more authority than Satan. So what the true believers want to happen will happen. Is that right? Is that what you're telling me, Michelle? Because uh, Biden's president now, so either you're full of shit claiming that believers have more authority than Satan, or you're full of shit that God cares what happens to the politics on this tiny little planet in this one country, or you're full of shit that God wanted Trump. Maybe God really wanted Biden. Why we can stand on this scripture, we can stand and say, number one, devil, you will not snatch out of God's hand what he is holding in his hand because he is God from eternity to eternity. Why would we need to do that? Isn't God all powerful? Can't he just like not let Satan snatch it? We have to step in and protect God. We don't want anybody grabbing God's hand or snatching something from it. I mean, that's what she's fucking saying here. Is this ridiculous to anybody else? Is it just me? And then the scripture goes on to say, no one can undo what I have done. So let's pray together now and say, Father, you are the God who is from eternity to eternity. And we say and decree and declare that no one, not even the devil himself, can snatch anyone out of God's hand. And no one, not even the devil himself, can undo what God has already done. Absolutely fascinating. You know what's even more fascinating? The fact that she was completely fucking wrong on all of it. Are we going to come back and get an apology from her on any of this? Is she going to try to backtrack and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I was mistaken. I, you know, I misread the situation. God didn't really speak to me. I don't really know that anything about the Bible. I'm just using it as a prop. Of course not. She's going to sit here and pretend that nothing happened. She's going to keep her mouth shut and move on like it never happened in the first fucking place.
Father, we thank you that you have sealed this election. Yes. We thank you that you are working according to your purposes. And Father, we declare mercy over the United States, mercy in this election. And we shout mercy, 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 mercy over this, to seal this in your name and in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I do. There is just something so fucking weird about it when she sits there and just starts talking directly to God. Like that whole last bit there, that was just her basically praying out loud to God. And it's just so strange. And why did she repeat herself like 17 times? Mercy, mercy, mercy. I, it's just weird, dude. It's just it's just very, very odd. But it doesn't stop there. There is more to this story. Michelle Bachman has had more to say since this whole failed prediction thing, right? She basically went silent for a while after that. Like, after, after that video we watched, she went totally silent. And then she started talking about taking your iron rod and smashing the clay jar. You guys remember that shit? She was like, I ask, oh God, Take that iron rod and smash that jar of delusion. Smash it. Joe Biden is not our president. You know, you guys remember that shit, right? I ask, oh God, that you would take your iron rod and I ask that you would smash the clay jar of deceit in America. Smash the clay jar of delusion in the United States of America. Smash the delusion, Father, of Joe Biden as our president. He is not. Yeah. Would you take your iron rod and smash the strong delusion that Nancy Pelosi does have her House of Representatives? We don't know that. Smash it in Jesus' name. Smash, Lord, the takeover of the U.S. Senate by Chuck Schumer. Lord, smash it with your iron rod. Well, after that, she went silent again, and now she's come out and had more to say. She actually created a conference where people were going to talk about false election results, basically. And it, it just got really fucking strange. So there's another article just came out March 29th on rightwingwatch.org. It's written by Kyle Mentila, and the title is Michelle Bachman Says the Election Was a Coup and H.R. 1 will forever cement democratic control. We're going to talk about what H.R. 1 is in a second, but let's just read some of this article and then watch the clip that goes with it. Former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman participated in a World Prayer Network call on Sunday night, during which she declared that Joe Biden's win in the 2020 presidential election was a coup and warned that passage of the For the People Act election reform legislation, H.R. 1, will forever cement that illegal takeover into place. On election night, Bachman boldly asserted that God had sealed this election in heaven on behalf of Donald Trump, and she has steadfastly refused to accept that her declaration had been premature and ultimately wrong. So let's watch this clip and see what she had to say for herself. I want everyone to realize what we're living through and what we're witnessing is a coup. This is called a coup, and a coup is a political term. And what it means is an unlawful, unauthorized takeover of a legitimate government. Okay, fascinating. Interesting. She's making some claims here, right? Okay. Now, I'm willing to hear her out, but uh, I've already heard this argument like a billion times, and it's already been debunked in open court like a billion fucking times. So unless she's got brand new information that nobody else has or has presented in open court, I'm just going to disregard it comfortably. Let's keep listening. America had a legitimate government, but this is an unauthorized illegal takeover through voter fraud in last November's election. And then now HR1 is to forever cement that illegal takeover into place. So let's find out what H.R. 1 actually is, because I was unsure at first. This is a Washington Post article about it. The title is, Here's What H.R. 1, the House Passed Voting Rights Bill, Would Do. It's by Peter W. Stevenson. 
written on March 5th. So let's read this and see what it says. House Democrats passed a comprehensive voting elections and ethics bill on Wednesday, part of what they say is an urgent effort to fight Republican efforts in states across the country to restrict ballot access. If passed, the bill would mark a huge expansion of voting rights and a major overhaul of campaign finance and redistricting laws. Republicans say they want to stop it in the Senate. Republicans at the state level across the country have proposed a wide range of measures, many in response to allowances that were made for voting during the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. The measures include curtailing eligibility to vote by mail, prohibiting the use of ballot drop boxes, and in the case of Georgia, where the GOP lost two Senate seats and which voted for a Democratic president for the first time since Bill Clinton's 1992 win, blocking early voting on Sundays. They also actually, uh, Georgia, from my understanding, made it illegal to pass out water to people standing in line to vote. Why? What's their logical explanation? I mean, it obviously I expected that kind of dirty, underhanded shit from the modern-day Republican Party, which is basically the evangelical voting bloc. But what logical explanation do they give for that? Like, usually when they do dirty, underhanded shit like that, they typically have a logical explanation for it. What logical explanation do they have for not allowing people to hand out water to people standing in line? Seriously. What's the logic? Anyway, let's keep reading. That particular measure has been called a flagrant and obvious attempt to disenfranchise black voters in the state. The chairman of Georgia's new House Special Committee on Election Integrity, State Representative Barry Fleming, Republican, said his committee's mission is to restore the confidence of our public in our election system, an allusion to the false claims spread by former President Donald Trump about voter fraud in the 2020 election. GOP officials in Arizona, Florida, Texas, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, all states that could have an impact on future presidential elections, are also considering legislation that would restrict voting. What's the fucking point? I mean, isn't voting a constitutional right? Am I mistaken? I just don't get it. What, how, what's their justification? What's the point here? That's why Democrats are moving forward with their bill at the national level. And while it might not pass in the Senate, they want to put pressure on Republicans who've called it a political power grab. It's not designed to protect Americans' vote. It's designed to put a thumb on the scale in every election in America so that Democrats can turn a temporary majority into a permanent control, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy said on Tuesday, Republican. Here's what the bill actually contains. A set of national voter registration and mail-in voting standards. H.R. 1 requires the chief election official in each state, the secretary of state in most, to establish an, an automatic voter registration system that gathers individuals' information from government databases and registers them unless they intentionally opt out. I'm down, man. You get your driver's license, you put all of your information down, you put your name and your address and your everything down in a government database to get your driver's license. They automatically take that exact same information, copy it over to the voter's registration. I'm down. Do it. Why the fuck haven't we done that already? Back to the article. And it says it's the government's responsibility to keep that information up to date based on information from agencies like state motor vehicle administrations, agencies that receive money from Social Security or the Affordable Care Act, the justice system, the federal agencies, including the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, the Social Security Administration, and others. I'm down. These places have information about people like that. You know, it's required. If you're getting your driver's license, they need that information to give it to you. It's a state-issued ID. Take that exact same information, copy it over into the voter's registration database. Why is that a bad thing? Why is that a problem? They're right there in front of you verifying that they are a real person and that they really are who they say they are. And even getting a picture of their face taken. And for some bizarre fucking outlandish reason... They're saying don't register these people to vote at the same time. I just don't fucking get it. The law would also guarantee voters same-day registration either at early voting sites or at precincts on election day. Each state would be required to allow at least 15 days of early voting for federal elections for at least 10 hours a day 
with at least some time before 9 a.m. and after 5 p.m. The law would limit how states can purge voter rolls. That's good news, too. I am so fucking down for this. I just don't understand how these people can justify all of these bizarre laws, like how they can justify demonizing something like H.R. 1. It's just straightforward, helpful, good shit that people can use to guarantee their constitutional right to vote. Why is that such a bad thing? I don't get it. So here we are with Michelle Bachman talking shit about some logical, normal, reasonable laws to allow people to vote. Let's keep listening. In last November's election, and then now HR1 is to forever cement that illegal takeover into place. I'm sorry, HR1 isn't cementing any illegal anything into place. It's guaranteeing citizens' rights to vote. That's it. There's nothing illegal about it. I understand that she doesn't like the fact that the majority of the country is Democrat or liberal. And if everybody votes, like literally everybody or more people vote, then Democrats win every single time. I get that that's an issue with her. But if if you don't like that, then change your platform to be more appealing to those people. She wants to have her cake and eat it too. She doesn't want to change her platform to be more appealing to these people. She wants to go further right. She wants to be hard right. She wants to be more extreme and also win elections. Doesn't work that way. If you don't like the fact that you're losing elections, then change your platform. Make no mistake about it. What we're watching is a coup. You see this in third world countries. It's happening in the greatest country in the world, the United States, but it is a coup. No, it's not. An example of a coup would be what we saw happening in Myanmar. That's not what Biden did. Now, Trump, on the other hand, what he did, that could be considered a political coup for sure. And it even turned violent on January 6th. I would call that a coup, definitely. A failed coup, but a coup nonetheless. I don't know how these people sleep with themselves at night. I don't know how they deal with who they are when they lay their head on the pillow. They have to have some level of psychopathy or sociopathy knocking around in there, seriously. It's so fucking disturbing what these people do, the lengths they go to to win elections. They're, they're, it's like there's no morality to be found in them sometimes. Next, we're going to talk about Pastor Hank Kinnaman's continued obsession with Trump. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The next article I wanted to look at is titled, Preacher, Christians Should Trust Prophets Who Said Trump Won the Election. This is by Beth Stoneburner on the Friendly Atheist website, so let's give it a read and see what it says. Nebraska preacher, I didn't know he was from Nebraska, Nebraska preacher and false prophet Hank Kuneman of One Voice Ministries, who still hasn't apologized for his wrong predictions about Trump serving a second term, and who says Joe Biden is only president because of treason, is still clinging to those false claims. Why, man? We talked about this recently with Johnny Enlow. Why? Why do it to yourself? Give it up, seriously. It's like an embarrassment at this point. Trump lost, Biden won, move on with your life, for real. Anyway, let's keep reading. He urged his flock this week to continue believing in prophets like himself because their predictions would eventually come true. Let's watch a clip that goes with it and see what he has to say. Now remember, President Trump won the election. And so for people to say, well, people prophesied that he'd win, he did win. And so we had a stolen election. And so the month of March has had a lot to celebrate. We've, you know, President Trump is not going anywhere. He's launched a media website uh, that you can go to and uh, begin to receive information. He's re-engaging himself. Uh See, this is really disturbing. As many of you guys know, I talk about cults all the time. And in 
cults, there are four methods of control that cults use to keep people from leaving, to keep people from realizing what's happening to them. There's behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control, right? What he's talking about here, where Trump isn't going anywhere, he's created a new social media network and everything else, this is part of Trump's method of controlling the information that people take in. He wants to, he lost his chance to be on Twitter. They kicked him off. So he had to create a new avenue, a new outlet for people to get information from him so he can continue controlling them that way. You can go to and uh, begin to receive information. He's re-engaging himself. Um, and you're not, listen, if you don't like President Trump, that's your problem because he's not done talking. And God's not done with him. And so that's, that's extremely important. And there are some things that have to... Pl Look, I know that this guy can't give up on the fact that Trump lost, but it's just embarrassing at this point, seriously. I keep wondering to myself, like, should I continue to cover these people? Like, I've been talking about Kuhneman and Johnny Enloe and Kat Kerr and Robin Bullock saying that Trump is, is still the president for fucking six months, dude. Seriously. At some point, you got to draw the line. But they are well known. I can't stop talking about this. I can't stop talking about these people. This is a real movement, a real cult that is continuing to grow and continuing to make claims like this. This isn't going to go away. These people will continue making these claims until they're blue in the face. I have to keep covering this. It's important. Let's keep listening your problem because he's not done talking and God's not done with him and so that's that's extremely important there are some things that have to play out because uh, we don't realize how really dark this this country has been and and the direction that you know the enemy and and those that cooperate with them would love to take this country so there's been a lot of signs in the month of March alone that are pointing to what I said, there's a there's an end result. There's a yeah. If you guys remember, the claim originally is that Trump was going to win November third, I think it was, or November fourth, whenever election was, and he lost. When that didn't work, the claim was like December the eighth, I think. When that didn't work, it was December fourteenth. When that didn't work, January sixth. When that didn't work, he incited an insurrection, and when that didn't work. They changed it to March 4th because they said that March 4th was when the old inauguration used to take place before, before they changed it in the Constitution. And they claimed that Trump was going to be the first president of the real republic since the Civil War took place. He's going to be inaugurated on March 4th. And guess what? It didn't fucking happen. So here we are. We've got Hank Kuhneman telling us the important things that took place in the month of March that are pointing to what I said. There's, a, there's an end result. There's a promise. There's a destination that God is trying to get us to, to, to understand. And it has to do with not man's timing. It has to do with the Lord's timing. And I constantly get people text. Oh, see, this is such an easy cop-out. It has nothing to do with man's timing. It's about the Lord's timing, i.e., it, it's not happening. We've been sitting here claiming it's going to happen any five minutes now, just like Jehovah's Witnesses claiming Armageddon's going to come. They've been claiming that since 1874, and lo and behold, it, it still hasn't happened. So the easy cop-out Jehovah's Witnesses go with, and the one that Hank Kuhneman is choosing here is, it's in God's time. It's in God's time, not in man's time. It'll happen when God is ready for it to happen. A day is like a year, and a year is like a day in God's time. If it feels like it's not happening quickly enough, then sit back and relax and let God do it in his own time. It's embarrassing, dude. Come on. Timing. And I constantly get people texting me, you know, and, and ask me questions. Well, when do you think this is going to be? That's going to be. And they throw out all these dates. And I've told them every time, uh, that's, that's not the date. Um, you're, 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 you're putting your own interpretation on it. And they say, well, Hank, do you know the date? No, but we can know times and seasons. And so I... No, but we can know times and seasons. Okay, so is he telling us that he knows a general vicinity? Because please give us a general vicinity. It's going to fail. 
Tell me when you think Trump is going to be president again. Lay it on me. It, you think it's going to be in the next six months? Guess what? I have six months to wait. I will sit in my happy ass right here until that six months is up. And we'll see. I will meet you back here in six months. So let's find out. We can know the times and the seasons, he says. Let's find out when he thinks this. Say it this way. I'm sensing very strongly by the signs that God is giving that we're going to review that we are close to justice and righteousness being established. And uh, Okay, that's not very specific. That's not specific at all. Do you know the fucking times and seasons or not? What we cannot do is, is try to, you know, uh, quit, give up, point the finger, and then begin to think, well, you know what, all of this was just a smokescreen. No, that's what the enemy wants. Because it's a sad day if all of God's messengers, prophets, intercessors, Christians were somehow wrong and, and the fake news that we know have been fake news were the voice of truth. I don't think so. Well, maybe you were the fake news all along. Did you ever think that one through? Did you ever suspect that may be the case? Maybe you were full of shit? And maybe the people you're calling fake news just so happen to be reporting accurate information? Let's get back to the article. This is from Beth Stoneburner. Uh, this is a quote from the video we just watched. President Trump won the election, Kunimin asserted. He did win, and so we had a stolen election. This is Beth Stoneburner speaking. And I'm a New York Times bestselling author. Saying it over and over again doesn't make it so. Here's a, another quote from the video. President Trump is not going anywhere, Kunimin added. What we cannot do is quit, give up, point the finger, and begin to think, well, you know what? All of this was just a smokescreen. No, that's what the enemy wants. This is Beth Stoneburner speaking again. God had four years to make Trump a good president. It didn't happen. God could have helped the election go another way. It didn't happen. God could have kept the Senate in Republican hands. It didn't happen. Maybe God is sending Kunimin a very different sign. Or none at all. 100% agree. Could be wrong. I think Beth Stoneburner, the writer, I believe that Beth Stoneburner is a Christian. E either way, I don't believe that uh, God is sending Kunimin a sign. Whether I was a Christian or not is, is irrelevant. Based on what the Bible says about people who love money, I don't believe God would back this guy, the God of the Bible. Even the vindictive one from the Old Testament. I don't think he would back this dude up. I just think he is completely outside of what the Bible describes as a good person. Let's keep reading what Beth Stoneburner said. Again, we repeat, no evidence for a fraudulent election was found. If you want evidence of people messing with elections, look to the Republicans trying to restrict voting rights in Georgia, Texas, and other states where they have the power to do it. They want to make it tougher to vote because they know a lower turnout and more obstacles hurts Democrats more than it'll hurt them. Kuneman doesn't seem concerned about any of that. 100% agree. And we did talk about all of the voting stuff earlier in the uh, fireside chat. If you're curious, go check out the other clips that released about this. Michelle Bachman wasn't super happy about the fact that Democrats are trying to make elections more accessible either. But... That's where we are in this country. The Republican Party is controlled by the evangelical voting bloc. I hate to say it, but if you vote Republican, you are voting to back an evangelical agenda. And it's fucking disgusting what they have to offer. Next, we're going to talk about a New York official fundamentally misunderstanding biology. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media. Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The next article I wanted to look at is titled, New York GOP Official. If we put gay people on an island, they'll die out in 40 years. This is on the Friendly Atheist website, written by Hemant Mehta. So let's give it a read and see what it says. George E. Langdon IV, a county legislator in Albany, New York, is facing backlash after claiming that if we just put all gay people on an island together, they'd die out within decades. He was speaking at a seminar called Return to Liberty Under the Constitution, 
at the faith-based Camp Pinnacle, and pretty much everyone involved in this charade should be condemned for one reason or another. Like Camp Pinnacle's director Stephen Flatch, who welcomed the mostly maskless 180-person audience by joking, I understand that most of you have a medical exemption. Thank you for exercising your rights. Haha, ha, it's hilarious because Christian negligence has helped lead to over 550,000 COVID deaths. Oh yeah, that's true, Hemant Mehta, 550,000 COVID deaths. Although a pretty significant portion of those were Trump's fault. I have to uh, blame Trump for a good number of those, at least 400,000. I guess we can blame them jointly. They were both to blame for that shit. Anyway, back to what he was saying. Or like the event organizer William Treon, who was literally arrested by the FBI this week for his role in the Capitol coup on January 6th. Holy shit, I think I read an article about that. But Langdon is the one getting all the attention, and for good reason. Here's his commentary on the gender issue, beginning at the 105.38 mark. Everything God does is sustainable. Amen. It's sustainable. Fascinating, everything you say. Like, everything? Even human life is sustainable? Because I'm pretty sure people wind down and die of old age eventually. Is the eye sustainable? Is that why people need glasses? Are the teeth sustainable? Is that why we need dentists? Everything is sustainable? Like literally everything? Even by this guy's own logic, what he is saying is nonsensical. And we haven't even gotten to the worst part. Let's keep listening. It goes on and on and on. It's perpetual. No, that's just fucking factually inaccurate. It's not. People wind down and die. Sorry, when you have homosexual relationships, it's not perpetual. I know lots of gay people who've been in, like, long-term relationships. I know some gay couples who've been together for 30 or 40 years. That's a long fucking time. Give them an island, they'll be gone in the 40 years. Okay? Because they can't... <laughs> Uh, they can't what? What were you going to say? What can't they do? God created us to be this way. There's I'm sorry. Did he just fucking forget how biology works? Does he think it's literally impossible for gay people to reproduce? Is he not thinking straight? Let alone adoption. Like, just throw that one out the window. I just can't stand this fucking guy or people like this. It drives me insane. As if gay people are completely incapable of reproduction. It's absurd. Really, the problem with what he's saying here is the fact that he's coming from the perspective that marriage or relationships should only ever be to produce a baby. That's it. You should only ever sleep with somebody if it's to produce a baby. And that's exactly what Kylie's health teacher was saying when she started talking about Jesus in health class. She said, marriage is for what? Silence, waiting for somebody to answer. A kid answered for after marriage, but she was actually getting at marriage is for producing children. You're not supposed to sleep with somebody unless you're trying to produce children. That is an extreme evangelical perspective, completely unreasonable, ridiculous evangelical perspective. And that's the one this guy holds, I guess. So in his weird little world, homosexuality doesn't make any sense. I'm just fucking glad I don't live in his weird little world. And the vast majority of the rest of us don't either. God created us to be this way. There's so much common sense that needs to be applied to our policies, our procedures, the things that we do in our government. This dude is absolutely ridiculous, and it's an embarrassment. Let's get back to the article. This is a quote from the video we just watched. Everything God does is sustainable. When you have homosexual relationships, it's not, it's not perpetual. Give them an island, they'll be gone after 40 years. This is Hemant Mehta speaking. Not that we need to address the bigotry, but it's telling that Langdon demonizes gay people because two men or two women couldn't have kids on their own, while saying absolutely nothing about straight couples who, for whatever reason, can't physically have kids either it's a good point if a straight couple are having trouble having children are they outside of god's order or whatever are they like not good christians because they can't have children that sounds like a flippant question but really it isn't there are people who really believe that i don't know what went wrong in these people's minds to lead them to some of these absurd conclusions but it is so fucking sad it is so sad 
to know that people hold some of these bizarre perspectives. Let's keep reading. This is Hemant Mehta again. It's also strange how years after marriage equality was legalized nationally, Langdon would still use his bizarre argument that an inability to have children is justification to oppose LGBTQ rights. Anyway, since telling the crowd about his fantasies of killing off gay people within decades, Langdon has faced calls to resign. He's also issued an apology, quote-unquote. Oh, fascinating. He's got an apology out. Okay, let's read the apology. Quote, I sincerely apologize to the LGBTQ community and all others for the hurtful remarks recently made at a conference, he said in a statement after the comments were shared on social media. I have never been homophobic, nor do I think any individuals should be placed on an island. I deeply regret my foolish off-the-cuff comment that has caused so much pain. I commit to doing a better job of respecting diversity. I hope my years of past public service demonstrate genuine concern for all individuals. I will be taking time to reflect on how to best serve moving forward. Honestly, I'm surprised that he even said that. I'm surprised he issued an apology at all. But he said it, you know, that, that it, when he said it, it was a glimpse into his headspace. It, was a, it gave us an opportunity to see who he really is and what he really thinks. So thank you for the apology. I'm glad that you submitted that, um, but I don't fucking believe it. I believe what you said in the first place. Back to Hemant Mehta. I've never been homophobic, quote unquote, says the conservative Christian who thinks the existence of gay people is an affront to God's creation. Even if his remark was off the cuff, it wasn't a gaffe. It, it's clearly something he's thought about before. He looks down on LGBTQ people because his Christian faith teaches him there's something wrong with them. Even Camp Pinnacle is trying to distance itself from the group that rented its space. This is a quote from Camp Pinnacle's Facebook, I think. And I guess Camp Pinnacle is where the event took place. Due to recent activity, the management and staff... Oh, shit, I just clicked the button, son of a bitch. I'm sorry. Due to recent activity, the management and staff would like to express that views and opinions expressed by groups who rent our facility are those of the organizers and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Camp Pinnacle. The aim and purpose of Camp Pinnacle has always been the same, to lift up Jesus Christ, to develop Christian character in young people, and to give them a happy, wholesome vacation. Wow, I'm actually surprised. So this is a Christian camp, I guess, who doesn't agree with anti-LGBT stuff. Genuinely surprised that they sided against the guy. Anyway, back to Hemant Mehta. As of this writing, Langdon hasn't resigned, though he may be censured at the county legislature's next meeting on April 12th. There's also a rally tonight calling for him to step down. Genuinely surprised by that. Honestly, I've seen this kind of thing happen before, where people, you know, pastors get a lot of pushback for some really fucked up stuff they say and my guess is what's going to happen is he's just going to keep his mouth shut and he's going to keep on keeping on doing what he always does and pretend that none of it is happening and in six months to a year everything will be back to normal just like nothing ever happened that's just how it works. Back to Hemant Mehta. But unless he's ready to admit his religion is flat out wrong about LGBTQ people, he has no business as a local government leader making decisions that will affect others' lives. While his Republican colleagues in Albany say they can't force him out as much as they'd like to wash their hands of him, they can do a hell of a lot more to make it clear faith-based bigotry has no place in their party. But they won't, because when you're a Republican, faith-based bigotry is what your party is built upon. No joke! That's not uh, an exaggeration. That's not flippant. That None of that. What Hemant Mehta said just here, when you're a Republican, faith-based bigotry is what your party is built upon, is accurate. Have you guys ever read the Republican Party platform? It's right there in the fucking platform. They are anti-gay marriage. How can Republicans sit there and claim to be for small government and also be in favor of regulating who's allowed to get married like that? You can't be both. Either you're for small government and thus for gay marriage, or you are for big government and against gay marriage. It's one or the other. There is no coherence to be found in the platforms and policies and ideals that people like this espouse. Thank you guys for coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week.
If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues, Issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.